thank you, Dave. It's good to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, really, I'm not going to have any data following all of those last few talks, uh, which might be a relief or, or not. But uh, mostly I'm just really here advocating and cheerleading for bringing forestry tools to bear to improve fire management and uh, in general restoration programs. Uh, I've been lucky to work with a number of great partners, several of them are, who are here today who know more, more about this than I do, but uh, um, it's kind of funny to have Joel lead into this because him and his company have helped us build a great deal of this capacity within Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife and a number of other partners. So um, again, just talking about how much we can bring forestry tools into our fire management programs to increase successes. Just for context, so Camp Edwards is 15,000 acres on Upper Cape Cod. It's really a dominant property on the landscape there and a key conservation area for, for Cape Cod and for the Pine Barrens ecosystem in southeastern Massachusetts. It's 15,000 acres within the overall 22,000 acres joint base Cape Cod. Fire really is our key management tool. It's our most cost efficient and, and effective at a large scale tool. Um, it's, it's fundamental to our long-term conservation management plans. And uh, we, we have a very active fire management program again that's uh, uh, very successful because of all of our partners. We have several ecosystem drivers why we do need to be managing and focusing on increasing our success with landscape scale restoration in any way we can. It is a Pine Barrens ecosystem, uh, so we have a whole host of state listed and otherwise rare species, and in general, a rare ecosystem, and we're a large block of it. Um, so we have a large stewardship responsibility there. And also being an Army training site, one of our key drivers is constantly expanding Army training opportunities on the landscape meeting their ever-changing needs for the ways that they do need to train on the landscape. We're going back now to more of what they were doing training for Vietnam than what they have been training for in Iraq and Afghanistan and things like that. So there are a lot of landscape management drivers with that. Luckily in a Pine Barrens ecosystem, those needs are coincident. Our long-term habitat sustainability needs are the same as the soldier training needs for the most part. We just need that well-planned disturbance. Then our other drivers are more based on risk management. We have a significant fire hazard because of our just that pine barren system and too little fire over particularly the last several decades. Um, but that leads to significant fuel loading and then um, because of the some of the stuff I'll get into soon, a lot of challenges with off-site resources. But then we're constantly trying to build our resilience of that ecosystem because small patch sizes in New England um, and ever increasing stressors to the environment. So again, how can we bring in more tools to make our landscape management and fire build better resilience to additional stressors, whether that's southern pine beetle or gypsy moth, or you can see, see that postcard from World War II down there. Wildfire has a significant history on Upper Cape Cod. You can see all the canopy trees there are dead and they've got their artillery guns set up on uh, regenerated scrub oak. So we're also building in that uh, overall ecosystem resilience to wildfire as well. There's a number of challenges. It's actually kind of funny, Jack, um, who's gonna follow me, is giving a talk about uh, impediments to getting fire on the ground right now in the other session. Uh, but that's part of the context of why we need to be bringing forestry into our fire management program is reducing all these challenges we have that keep us from getting enough prescribed fire. Who out there gets enough burn days in a given year? Does anybody feel like they ever get enough burn days to do what they're planning to do? I know we don't. Um, but of course, Eastern Massachusetts is very heavily urbanized. Uh, here's just a couple context photos for what we deal with at Camp Edwards. Our boundaries are defined by the major highways of Cape Cod and heavily converted landscape and urbanized areas. Uh, that brings in a lot of challenges, whether it's uh, smoke management concerns or public relations and overall um, uh, attitudes towards fire. Um, and when you come onto Cape Cod, it doesn't matter which bridge you come on, almost everything in your view shed is Camp Edwards. So when we do a burn, it's very high profile. This is one of our smoke plumes, and you can see like the RV and all the cars backed up on the bridge coming out of the Cape. So 
we have very high public visibility. The fuel loading and the fire hazard reduction that I was talking about, again, we need more tools than just fire on the landscape to get back to where it was in the 50s and 60s when they were regularly firing artillery on the base. This is what the fire return interval sort of used to look like on Camp Edwards. You can pick out individual rocks when you look at this photo from 1958 because there's almost no tree canopy, very little uh, shrub cover because it burns so much and they cut so much of it over. Um, you can see all the black up here. These are where artillery rounds exploded and lit little fires in the impact area. I don't know if you can see it on this, but there's active smoke right here because there's a burn going on right there on the rocket range. However, because of contamination and other issues, we don't have these explosive ignition sources anymore and haven't for several decades, or at least a few decades. So ever since this fire return interval left, now we've just been having uh, scrub oak and pitch pine encroach, where now the base is dominated by very high density uh, pine oak forests or pitch pine scrub oak. Unexploded ordnance, related to that last one, is a, is a significant challenge. And again, it limits what we can do with fire, it limits what we can do with mechanical forestry. So it drives us to bring as many tools to bear as we can um, and plan them strategically. Our dead areas are coincident with our boundary on the whole eastern side of the base. So we even have to bring in specialized tools such as robotics to try to do some of our forestry and, and work with uh, other military programs to try to get some of that done. But again, this just sets that context for how um, we have so many challenges to getting that fire on the ground that we need to make ourselves more effective. This is one that we've been paying a lot more attention to lately, and it even relates to some of those earlier talks today. But one thing that I often hear about is uh, you know, trying to thin with fires. We're, we're trying to get a densely overgrown ecosystem from fire suppression back into more of a, a pine, shrub, savanna setting and open up that canopy for um, you know, more natural pine barren setting for say the 15 species of state listed moth we have there and whippoorwills and everything else. But if we're trying to actually accomplish that with fire on a short time interval, this is what we're left with. And all the gray you see there are dead trees. This, this was a burn we did in 2013, and well over a third of the trees are dead now as standing snags. Um, from an army base perspective, that's really bad. We try to build as much support from the soldiers as we can with the projects we do, because otherwise we're just bunny huggers, you know. And uh, so when we take a unit like this, and we're trying to do restoration and training site management, but we put it 200 acres off the line for soldier training, because of the snag hazard, that's pretty counterproductive. <clears throat> it also means we can't re-enter that with fire for probably another 20 years unless we do a post-burn mechanical treatment now. So that's one that, uh, that is a real big driver for trying to strategically integrate more tools to our restoration. And then back to those burn days, all those challenges add up along with everything else like weather and resources we just plain don't get enough burn days. So how can we open up more burn days and have more units available on the burn days that we do get? So th this is kind of silly, but um, it's just for us to have any success, we need to try to be meeting more of those objectives under the ecosystem drivers, reducing our challenges. And how we can do that is holistic planning up front and integrating as many tools as we can. This was something we had just started to do with the Texas National Guard when I was down there where we had been trying to just do our restoration with fire. In some of those projects, after 15 years, we were actually having really good success, but we didn't have to worry about urbanization and all those issues down there that uh, impeded our ability to get enough fire on the ground. We could let it smolder for three weeks and we didn't care. Um, here we don't have that flexibility and um, and even down there, we needed more tools than just the fire. We started bringing that mechanical, um, and we've learned from our partners, and we've started having great success with it here. Um, but we need to, to bring in those additional tools, bring in that mechanical preparation. Um, 
So there are a number of different tools. This is kind of was the classic for a long time uh, on the Cape, it seemed, uh, and still has a lot of use and a lot of uh, practical utility. Uh, this is using you know, a bobcat to mow the scrub oak understory, which you can see in here, it's not an atypical situation for the base, but that scrub oak is quite a bit taller than the bobcat even. Um, it's pretty obvious why we might want to, to treat those fuels mechanically. Um, but you know, some of the projects are even bringing in a uh, brontosaurus excavator with the big head to do whole tree mastication. And there's pros and cons to that, and uh, I'm not getting into the weeds on any of on any of that really today. I don't have time for it. But but um, talking to folks who are doing this, and they're scattered all over. Whether it's you know Albany Pine Bush or uh, Joel's folks or any of the resource managers that you know that are doing this, Fish and Fisheries and Wildlife, they can give. Uh, Good help on deciding what which of these tools to use where. Um, one of the more classics is the you know classic timber harvest, leaving a lot of the top wood. Um, that's often pressed uh, because people want the coarse woody debris for wildlife habitat. And again, we're trying to holistically manage a site, but also people want to make sure that there's uh, nutrient cycling into the soils and things of that nature. However, for us in a barrens ecosystem, we generally want more depauperate soils. We don't want put all that somewhat unnatural uh, buildup of biomass in the canopy to now be making its way into the soil. The more we want to be removing a lot of that from the site. And really we're trying to strategically place our treatments more scattered and patchy around the training site so we're not too concerned about the loss of coarse woody debris and a small patch size on a landscape scale. So what we've been doing and what others have been doing is more of this whole tree harvest taking out the entire tree, generally because of the pine barrens, we don't have merchantable timber, they're chipping the whole thing and shipping it up, uh, trucking it up to power plants in Vermont, New Hampshire for uh, biomass energy production. Um, so we're still paying you know, $1,500, $1,800 an acre, but from the ecological perspective, the fuels management perspective, and even the solar training perspective, we're having much greater success with implementing these whole tree harvests than we would if we were leaving that, all that top wood on site. Uh, this, is, this is one of the cuts we did. Um, this is from one of the artillery observation points on the base, which we've now restored. You can see past about 10 feet from that site, whereas up until um, mid-70s, that was one of their primary uh, observation points for forward observers for artillery units shooting in the impact area. Um, so we've restored that for training and then actually starting tomorrow is going to be the first time in probably 35 years that an artillery unit has set up here. So they're going to have their observers on the ridge line, have the big guns set up down below where we've restored it, and they're going to be practice firing on blank rounds. They can't shoot live artillery anymore. But that's, that's what I'm talking about, about building a broader stakeholder base even within the Army. So now we're not the bunny huggers, we're the guys that support the field artillery unit. But this is a crane wildlife management area up here. You can see it was a whole tree harvest, but just a, a different prescription, you know, slightly different goals there. And so you have a lot of flexibility. And that's one of the keys here with integrating the forestry is you have a lot of flexibility in setting what you want your post-treatment condition to be. So whereas with fire, we can set a lot of good objectives with fire, and there's a lot of science behind it. So we can know, depending on our emission patterns, and depending on the weather conditions, and conditions, what we're going to get from that. But we don't have that fine control dial that we do with a lot of the mechanical pre-treatments. Bringing in good forestry planning um, with subject matter experts on that. And both from the habitat perspective and the forestry perspective. Whoops. Put my finger in the wrong place there, I guess. Um, bringing all of that together to set the definition for that site, realize it with the, the forestry preparation, and then run the fire through there, and you're in maintenance mode pretty quick, and you've got the post condition um, that you were looking for to begin with, rather than having the reduced control that you would necessarily, or potentially with the fire, where sometimes all the planning you put into that fire, and you still kill half the trees, which long term is probably still beneficial impact from a pine barrens perspective, but short term has a lot of uh, negative implications. 
So just for some regional context, although still fairly local, as we're up here in Maine, um, but I just again wanted to point out there's a lot of partners out there that are doing this and we've been lucky to be able to learn from them. But just even close, this is a uh, joint base Cape Cod boundary here. And then uh, Miles Standish State Forest is at the uh, northwestern part of the photo there. And Pine Barrens Wildlife Management Area. Um, and then to the south, Crane Wildlife Management Area. And then there's a bunch of uh, smaller conservation lands where we're all, we've been using mastication, still using mastication, but starting to do more of this whole tree harvest. And again, everybody's trying to bring more of these tools to bear and um, be more successful with their restoration programs. And you can see that, um, just sort of how we're scattering this around the landscape in a patchy sense, but it's also, you know, this is the boundary of our impact area. So where we're losing a lot of that open shrub, um, just open shrubland barren habitat in the impact area due to pitch pine encroachment, we're now able to recreate some of that habitat condition mechanically, and uh, as well as meet those soldier training needs and uh, get fuel reduction, most importantly, around the impact area. So back to those first several slides I went through. Um, this obviously is just kind of as, as crudely qualitative as you can get, but we're seeing really great improvement in all of those ecosystem management drivers, the objectives that we're able to meet by bringing forestry in pre-treatment with fire. Um, we're better able to meet our habitat goals. We can. We've now been bringing the soldiers in more early or earlier to, uh, you know, like I said, we had great success with that, setting up that site for an artillery unit, but now we're bringing in other units such as infantry. We can tailor these cuts to the different training needs of different units in the National Guard while still meeting all of those habitat objectives and fuel reduction objectives. But then even on the challenges, we're seeing all of those challenges being reduced. We're opening up more burn days because now by getting the, the pre-fire -treat, uh, pre treatment in there with forestry, we can work closer to the urban areas because we're not as worried about the smoke production or the uh, fire behavior. We're making things more predictable, making things more manageable. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's scary when you're, when you're talking about doing this is you're front-loading all of your costs and complexity on these restoration projects. Whereas it might feel kind of comfortable to run a fire through there, wait 20 years, and try to re-enter it with fire. Now we're bringing in all this cost. So, um, like I said, it's not merchantable timber. We're paying up to $1,800 an acre. And that seems a little daunting up front. And we're also now having to go through more permitting processes, bring in all these stakeholders. <coughs> it's not just doing a burn plan and lighting a fire anymore. We're bringing all this in. But again, that's countered with we can set much more specific objectives for a site and actually implement those with more intent on the ground and much more control. And we're taking our restoration timelines from a 30 or 40 year, if we're just doing it with fire, down to like three years, and we're in maintenance mode with fires now. So we can, we can cut, burn a larger area that's been much more accessible now because of that cut, and be in maintenance mode pretty quickly with that restoration. And, you know, and then be counting whippoorwills, watch their trends going up through the roof or re-entering with moss surveys. Uh, so again, you're, you're front-loading the cost and complexity, but you're getting much greater success because of all of it. So, you know, I'm not, this is my one wordy slide, but I don't need to get into it too much. It really, you know, you want to bring in all the stakeholders early to set your <laughs> management objectives based on the habitat. Obviously, this is fairly focused on pine barrens, um, so there are other considerations depending on where you're at. But the key to success on all this is bringing in your partners. And there's a lot of resources out there, and at least in my experience and around where I'm working, there's a lot of partners eager to help, and we've benefited a great deal from that. And bringing in your subject matter experts. Set up the interdisciplinary team for that treatment. For us, we do have soldiers at the table. We do have the fire managers and the foresters and the habitat biologists all there setting the goals together so that this one project is meeting those multiple objectives. And that's what's also made us much more successful is that now that we have one project meeting the drivers for all of these different stakeholders, we get much better buy-in, much better support, and more importantly, better funding. 
much more funding certainty now that I'm meeting the soldier training needs with that same project. Um, so I can bring in all these different funding sources and my assumption would be that would also be true for those who are more grant funded that typically the grants are so focused on a particular aspect but if you can be showing that you're meeting these multiple multiple drivers then hopefully there's multiple funding sources that can apply to that. And, you know, you might have a state wildlife grant component for your habitat, but a fire hazard reduction grant for, for that aspect of the project. Um, and then just as far as that front-loaded cost and complexity, what that's driven for us is much greater prioritization and planning, which we should be doing anyway, but this um, adding in the forestry gives us more intent with that. This photo here, it, it probably looks a little messy at the scale, I should have made that bigger, but really what this is showing, this is where we're taking our burn plans now, is we're looking at a much larger landscape scale. Instead of just doing, say, a 100 or 200 acre unit, we're now looking more at like 1,500 acres and over the course of a few years and planning all of our forestry management projects in there with the intent of burning those and our timing on those and how we're treating them specifically. So this even has different, different forestry treatment types built into this just based on what our fuel conditions are, what our habitat goals for that site are, and some of the complexity, such as the impact area here. So now we can be building all that in with much greater intent than we were before, and making units that were almost unburnable before because of their proximity to the impact area, and planning to start burning them this, this spring, probably. So. Um, bringing that forestry in is making us much more successful, and I've seen that with so many of our partners. And so really, like I said, this is just more an advocacy talk than a data talk, obviously. But anybody who's not already doing this, the best thing I can encourage you to do is to start doing it. And wow, I lost track of that <laughs> clock of the time, but uh, luckily. So this is uh, just the course of eight months, one of our project sites, that one with, for the field artillery unit, where it went from you know, no visibility to cut to burning in June, and then that's in August with it greening back up. So um, again, there's there's no one tool for restoration success. Integrating these tools is is really the best thing that I can encourage any managers to do. So, thank you. Talk a little bit more about how you weigh the soldiers' needs versus the ecological needs, and I'm sure it's a little more complex than um, that you can go into too much detail. But. Well, I mean, the, the, the quick and dirty of it is that 
my folks in my program are the ones, you know, we're constantly thinking about the habitat and wildlife and rare plant uh, needs of the ecosystem. And, but not much familiarity with what the soldiers need. So, but half of my program is funded by soldier training support. And so we're constantly bringing these, these different army units in to tell us exactly what they need. And just as with any project, so when we did this, this cut here, they were just <coughs> as thrilled, but we started having infantry guys come to us and saying, you know, this, this is awful, like we need something that, that works for us, you know. It got them engaged, and it, it was kind of funny, now they were starting to think about us more and what we could do, but, but they hated this one, because it was just a spot where they would get ambushed with rockets. You know, you've got a ridge, and the road right at the bottom of it, and they're super exposed. So now they want a site where they can play, and so they'll tell us exactly what they want. They want the spot that we can build that has, you know, hatches for them to hide a Humvee, and where they can move here to here and have cover and work on the skills that they need to build. I would say they need to build skills that deal with situations like this too. But, um, <laughs> but, but so really, it's just as with any of these projects, whether you're working for the Forest Service or anybody else, it's bringing in your stakeholders. They'll tell you what they need. And uh, we can just pour over the maps. Even better, we can go to sites we've already treated, talk about what we did that works and doesn't work for them. But the soldiers aren't shy about telling you what they want. <laughs>